Hi everyone, this is EDIT 5100, Chapter 10, 11, and 12, Augmentative Communication. So the reason why is, as I've said before, this book does start to repeat itself a little bit, so I just kind of picked out the most important parts of Chapter 10, 11, and 12, and then um, I'm going to lecture you guys in the, on this uh, PowerPoint. All right, chapter 10, selecting and designing a student's augmentative communication system. There are categories of augmentative communication technology. Again, there's unaided, which means um, it does not require any type of device. We talked a little bit about that when it came to sign language as being considered an unaided type of augmentative communication technology. Uh, uses gestures and facial expressions to respond to yes and no. So like nodding yes and no, or shaking your head back and forth. Uh, personalized and only familiar people may understand it because let's say that you say three fingers mean something and then that means that you and that person who know each other would know but a person outside of that circle would not necessarily know what that means. American Sign Language is considered an unaided system and just in case you did not realize this American Sign Language is not the same as let's say Spanish in Mexico it's not the same as French it's not the same as Chinese. Each culture has their own specific sign language. And you would think, hey, you know, wouldn't it be so much better if it was universal? And it would be, but we have to realize that there are uh, symbols and gestures that represent something that in one culture, but that might not necessarily apply to another culture. So again, there might be some universal uh, symbols or gestures. However, overall, they're actually different languages. There's low tech devices that use simple non electronic aids, a uh, picture board or communication board with symbols. So that means like a chart with, uh, let's say, pictures on each uh, square that represents something that a student can or a child can or an adult can point to. Uh, there's beginner users usually use this before they start to go and advance into technology because we don't want to waste all this stuff uh, if they still haven't figured out how to do all that stuff just yet. Serve as a backup for those with mid or high tech devices. And again, remember, we always have to consider what happens if uh, your iPad runs out of battery and you don't have a charging source or you don't have your charging cable. You might then need to then pull out your handy dandy low tech stuff, which is a paper version, a PEX board with Velcro to communicate instead until it's fully charged. And you know, even then, sometimes it takes like an hour to charge a device fully before you can really access it and everything like that. There's mid-tech, which is electronic devices that are easy to program, like recorded speech, uh, relative in, relatively inexpensive, and flexibility to use a variety of printed overlays or pictures, symbols, or words. So we had talked about that in the previous chapters about communication. Um, where it might be one device where you slide these sheets in and each sheet has a barcode so it knows that this one, all the words are related to lunch and then you pull that one out, you put another uh, sheet in there with a the barcode and it's all about recess, right? So um, that would be considered like a mid-tech because it's kind of digital but it's not really a computer. It's more of a software program and uh, it can be affordable as well. High tech is specialized computers that offer many features and options such as like an iPad or some other tablet. It uses recorded speech and synthesized speech so you can actually record your own voice to the communication board for your child or for your student or your partner and stuff like that. Um, and then also touchscreen display. And then Wi-Fi allows for emails, internet, environmental controls. Um, so these things would be considered like smartphones, iPads, and Android-based tablets would be considered high-tech stuff because there's touchscreen, there's, you know, it's a computer basically, and that would be considered high-tech. So um, one of the things that we want to talk about is the uh, uh, assessments that people use to help determine what devices are really good for your student or your client. Um, the set framework is the most popular one in this book. And so I want you guys to click on the set and then basically understand how the assessment is used and described and um, hopefully that will help. There's also the partner assisted scanning or AIOU chart and that is usually just one chart with the alphabet. Please click on the AIOU chart and then you will see how it works. It's really fascinating with a person with um, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS um, and how they work with their, uh, their personal attendant 
and how they can communicate when, let's say, that they have a specific type of uncomfortableness with their uh, breathing apparatus or whatever. Okay, so guide for meaningful vocabulary. So number one, provide messages that enable the student to greet other students and begin a conversation. So if you're gonna record something, it might be something similar to what the students are using at that time. So that goes along with a couple of other things here, but let's say that all the cool kids are saying, yo, what's up? So you might wanna record, yo, what's up? Instead of, hello, how are you? Because that's not necessarily part of what the kids are doing these days. So you would want to personalize it so that that specific client or person or child or friend or whatever feels like they're part of the crew, the group and stuff like that. Two, include vocabulary that enables the student to comment on events and activities, both as a way to express his or her opinion and as a way to continue a conversation. So things like, ooh, that's so cool, tell me more, or something like that might be one of the buttons that the people, the person can press so that they can communicate that with the person who they are communicating with. Three, provide vocabulary that includes specific people who are important in the student's life so they can be called. So instead of saying like, friend, you might want to say your friend's name is um, Michelle. So you can put Michelle's picture there so that that person can choose that picture and that will directly go towards a Michelle, right? Uh, four, include favorite activities or objects to enable students to request them. So if they really, really love to play with a, I don't know, a Switch, Nintendo Switch or something like that, then you, you can put that icon on there so that they know that they can play with that. All right, five, make sure the student has a way of conveying his or her feelings that make me angry, that makes me sad, or I'm not happy with that and stuff like that so that they are able to express those uh, emotions because we don't want them to be pent up and not be able to express those things. If they're upset with an event, they should, and then you should be able to talk them through it so that it de-escalates into um, uh, something that's not necessarily violent or, or negative. Six, include a method of protest, such as, I don't wanna do that, I need a break, I wanna be alone. Those are things that you should let them uh, be able to express if they're trying to express those things, because sometimes we just need a break from school or a break from activities and just you know breathe in and breathe out for five, 10 minutes, and then they can resume again. Um, Seven is use age-appropriate and culturally sensitive words and phrases, including slang, like I said before. No one uses on fleek anymore, but you know that might be a button on there for someone who's gonna, you know, like, who likes to have their nails done or something like that. And then eight, incorporate humor and sarcasm if age-appropriate. So um, again, you can actually record it so that it sounds sarcastic and then they can express those sarcastic moments that they want to as well. Like, ha ha, that's really funny or something like that. And then that allows them to have like a wide range of ways of communicating feelings and emotions and thoughts. In chapter 11, we talk about challenges of early communication development in students with disabilities. So we're talking about really young children. Okay, infants. Um, number one, cannot independently interact with people and objects in the environment due to hearing, vision, or motor difficulties. Two, do not currently possess the cognitive abilities needed to be fully symbolic independent communicators. And three, are not provided with multiple opportunities to engage in communicative rich environments with a variety of competent partners. So again, if you see and look, listen and consider all these different uh, disabilities, obviously if they're not able to do what a typical child is able to do during this time period, their communication skills are going to be stunted, right? Or behind, and we don't wanna do that. And that's why when we find out in early early interventions or early detection, we have early interventions so that they do not fall behind because we know that they might need additional supports to be able to catch up with everyone else. So switch controls, how, a, how to pair a switch to your smartphone, ISO 7, obviously now we're on ISO 12. So I just want you to quickly maybe watch it so you can see how it is updated to a switch. So you can actually pair a switch to your phone so that then they can operate their phone in a different way if they want to. In here, you can also look at these pictures right here. Um, the one on the left, the young lady in the, um, it looks like a motorized wheelchair. You can see the lower bottom part of her, her, left, her left knee is a button. It's a yellow button. And then that will control, let's say, the computer that she's using in front of her. So it might be a scanning technique where it's scanning options. And then every time she wants something, she can, uh, move her leg and that will turn on the switch 
and then that will activate whatever needs to be selected. There's also a button that allows a child to, let's say, press it to let them know that they want to use the restroom. Or uh, you can see in the lower right hand corner, it looks like a button that's connected to a little minion so that they can play with a minion similar to the Tickle Me Elmo where they can press it and then the, the toy will interact with them in one way or another. In chapter 12, teachers' roles in augmentative communication is really important because the way that you design the class, if it's designed universally, will be more accessible to a student with many types of disabilities. Obviously, we cannot address every type of disability imaginable, but if we know what kind of students we have um, and their abilities, then we know how to then you know uh, cater towards that. So adapting the curriculum is really important. Uh, writing goals and objectives for augmentative communication users so that they understand how to uh, show you as the instructor the information that they're learning, the way that they're processing. Three, acting as a liaison between the team and the student's parents so you can communicate and let them know, you know, your child is doing really great. They're learning through this program, you know, and of course letting them know that by having these assistive technology devices is actually benefiting your child quite a bit. There's also providing the ongoing skill development and communication. So maybe a child who is younger might use a more basic device, but as they get older, they're going to use more complex, complicated, or multi-purpose in one device as opposed to like 10 different devices for 10 different things. Identifying appropriate vocabulary for them as well, teaching them how to use respectful language, so their behaviors and all that stuff that we've been talking about uh, goes into what typical people are expected of uh, children and as they grow older, you know, their complex vocabulary communication. Determining students' communication needs, and of course, training others in using the augmentative communication devices. So let's say you have a TA, you would want to teach the TA how to use it as well. Or other people, if that is within your reach, you can teach those people how to use those things as well. Tips for guiding parents to promote the use of augmentative communication. Provide direct instruction to the use of the system. So definitely have a, either a YouTube tutorial or an instruction book if it's something that's not too thick uh, and stuff like that will, will allow a person to learn how to use it. Identify vocabulary that is relevant to the home. So if you're creating, let's say, an augmentative communication device like a uh, the prolo quo, you might want to add additional stuff that are home related as well, not just school. So the child can learn how to use the device in every place. It's called generalization um, so that they don't just use that device only at school and then they, you know, revert back to different things like pointing and stuff like that um, at home or, you know, at the library. Um, teach family members to provide opportunities for communication and to wait. Uh, so having patience is really important. Provide simple data in evaluation sheets for home and community use. Give parents permission to expand the child's communication. So again, if a parent wants to add additional things to the device, they should be able to as well. So teaching them how to do it so that they can also play around with it. The more they play around with it, the more they are, know how to use it. And that will only make that child's ability to communicate even better. And of course, you want to keep everything simple. You don't want a bunch of stuff connected that complicates the device. You want to make it as user friendly as possible. Here are some vocabulary samples that might communicate different types of messages. Let's say commenting, you might want to have a page that has the ones that say, that's cool, or I'm not a fan, or no fair. And then there's also things like questions, like what is your favorite TV show? If they want to learn how to communicate and socialize with other people, or they might say, what do you mean? There's also protesting or rejecting, such as, no, I don't want to, or leave me alone, or I hate this. And of course, requesting such as, Missy, I need help, or can I play? Can I have a snack? Could you explain that again? So again, these are very common questions that people might ask, a student might ask in conversation. So you want to provide all these things so they can use it. So they have this really rounded uh, sense of communication. Okay, and then of course, commanding such as cut it out, stop bothering me, get out of the way, or change the channel. So things like that you want to consider to put onto a communication board for them to communicate with other people. Um, there's also the augmentative communication checklist for participation in general education classrooms. So this is something that we want to have a checklist to see whether or not this device is ideal for this specific uh, child, client, student, person. 
Examples would be, does a student system enable him or her to participate in classroom discussion? Would be yes, a little or no. You're going to ask a teacher to evaluate this. Um, and then from there, you can talk to a specialist and then you guys can decide whether or not another device might be a little bit more uh, beneficial for that specific client. I'll read a couple more uh, questions on this survey. Uh, does a student system enable him or her to answer questions? Does a student system enable him or her to ask questions? Can the student use his or her system for quick response or messages? Is there a way for the student to gain attention from a distance? Does the student system enable him or her to initiate a conversation? Um, does the student system enable him or her to protect or protest or reject something he or she does not want to do? That is to say, no. And does the student have a way to use unique and personalized vocabulary? Again, a lot of the stuff that we have been discussing through, we want to make sure that all those things are in consideration. So this checklist would be a really, really wonderful way uh, for everyone to see whether or not this device is actually really helping this child or person or user.